Good evening, everyone. Tonight on The Primary Source, I'd like to introduce Wall Street veteran turned executive coach and Columbia professor Chuck Garcia. How are you doing tonight? I'm very well. How are you, Frank? Quite well. Glad to have you here. Now, you spent over 25 years on Wall Street with leadership positions at Bloomberg, BlackRock, and Citadel. I think it's pretty safe to say you know your stuff. What initially made you pursue a career in the financial world? Actually, I, I, I was eight years old. Uh, by happenstance, I saw it. I don't know if it was something on the television, something in the newspaper. I saw a picture of a bunch of guys doing whatever they do on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I didn't know what they were doing, and I didn't know what it meant, but there was something inside of me that says, one day I need to be a part of that. So as I was old enough in high school to figure out what it all meant, the more I read about it, the more I was utterly intrigued and captivated by this entire notion of investing in something, in an asset. So for there, I was hooked. And then throughout the rest of high school, I dedicated myself to make sure that when I go to college, I was going to be a finance major. And I became a finance major for one reason only, and that was to get myself to Wall Street. So how did your career in finance begin? Where was your original start? Actually, it was when I was at Syracuse and I was a finance major in my senior year, I knew I, need, I needed to do two things. One, I wanted to make my parents proud. And two, I wanted to get off of their payroll. I wanted to be sure that they raised us to be financially independent, and I needed a great job outcome in a Wall Street firm. So back in the days, that was 1982, I wrote 90 cover letters to every bank and financial institution you could possibly think of because my professors had no executive experience. They were career academics and were of no assistance to me on getting to Wall Street. The career placement office was a 24-year-old anthropology major, so she was no help to me. So I took it upon myself to, to put my fate into my own hands. And one thing led to another. I started in a training program for corporate lending with an institution that is now defunct called European American Bank. Eventually, you became sales manager for Latin America at Bloomberg. How did those two segue? Yeah, it was a little, it was like in any career, like in any mountain, there are certain twists and turns that occurred. From EAB in that training program, I found it very dull and disengaging, and I knew that I needed to make a change. So one thing led to another. Long story, through a, a mutual friend who placed me with an executive recruiter, I went to this emerging company, which was a financial technology company, which was the system that was developed to help money managers manage their money. I was there for almost four years. And then again, through another twist and turn, unbeknownst to me, somebody had introduced me to this emerging technology appearing on trading floors called Bloomberg. And I said, what the hell is a Bloomberg? I soon found out that it was in the same neighborhood as the store Bloomingdale's. So I had to first make a distinction between one and the other because they were only a block apart. But somebody encouraged me to, to check them out. I wrote a letter blindly to the sales manager. Uh, he invited me in. I walked into that office, and they had me at hello. I walked out with the job offer. I was 190th employee. But at the time that that occurred, I had no idea what I was walking into or the success that was ultimately going to come from this institution. So, Frank, the lesson here is sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. So I, I, I count myself as having been incredibly fortunate for a twist and turn that I could not have possibly predicted. I see. That, that is very lucky indeed. Indeed. Now, I think I, that, that's a tale to everybody out there. No matter how smart you think you are, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So how did you segue from this early introductory job all the way to sales manager for Latin America? Well, that job in between the bank and Bloomberg was an emerging company in the financial technology space that was developing systems to help asset managers automate and mechanize what was otherwise a very manual process. In order to be good in that job, I had to demonstrate a solid foundation for the skills of value investing, understanding the assets of equities, fixed income, and all the different capital markets on Wall Street. I could not have gotten to Bloomberg without the success of that company. And when I got to Bloomberg, 
my first job was a salesman. I was a traveling salesman, and my territory was Florida, Georgia, Alabama, North, and South Carolina. So for the first year, I was traveling down to those states selling the Bloomberg services. Lo and behold, again, through a lucky break, a phone call came in from somebody in Puerto Rico. And when that call came in inquiring about who can I speak to that can help me buy Bloomberg, nobody on the floor when the call came in, this big, look at the big trading floor, somebody screamed out, does anybody here speak Spanish? And I listened to that and I was quite good in Spanish, though I couldn't claim any fluency. Nobody else was raising their hand. So I said, what the hell? I think I'll raise my hand. So I raised my hand thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do in this conversation, but my four years of high school Spanish have got to count for something. So the guy talked to me, and I bumbled through in Spanish, and my boss said, congratulations, you're now responsible for Latin America. I said, oh, great. That's how it worked. And then from Puerto Rico, once we started to demonstrate success there, we received a phone call from the Central Bank of Mexico and the Central Bank of Chile. So immediately I got on an airplane and I went to Mexico. A week later, I was in Chile, in Santiago, Chile. Now we were on to something because from there I started contacting the central banks of all of the Latin American countries and the rest was history. So it was a little bit of luck. It was an aggressive outreach that once I knew we were on to something, it was my responsibility to grow the business because now I shifted my entire focus from what was being responsible for the southeast region of the United States to now everything south of the border, which included any Caribbean countries and then all of the Latin American countries. And all together, it was probably a dozen different countries that I spent developing business and opening offices for over the course of seven years. Wow. That, yes. is, that, that is a journey. And it was a great journey and one that I am forever grateful. It was awesome. My Spanish got really good. I traveled all the time. And it was the only way as, as if you're going to develop business, you got to get in an airplane and you got to go where the people are that have the potential to buy what you're selling. So it was a boots on the ground, visit one company after another, after another. It was an amazing, absolutely exhilarating run. And I will never forget how how fortunate I was to be able to have that position and then to have succeeded in it. That, that is amazing. That's really cool. So after you became this sales manager for Latin America, you ended up changing positions to strategic marketing manager. What, what eventually caused you to shift from sales manager to marketing manager? Uh, I was first asked to moved to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and open up the Latin American office in a more regional role. So Mike Bloomberg said, the business has really grown in Latin America. We need to be in its backyard. We would like you to be responsible for all of Latin America, but in order to do that, you have to move to Brazil. i had been to Brazil a lot of times, but I knew that for it, this was a big family decision, and my family did not want to move to Brazil, and I don't blame them because I didn't want to move to Brazil. So I use that as an opportunity to say that now I've got to move on to something different. What happened is my whole role changed because now that I succeeded in a business that was driven by this transnational or international component that really branded me within the company as one of the most international guys in the firm. I was also a pretty good public speaker and I spent a good deal of time both internally in Bloomberg explaining my strategy and tactics for how we succeed in Latin America and I occasionally spoke at conferences where people asked me to speak about Bloomberg and what it meant to the industry. Lo and behold, my boss said, well, you're really good at this. We are going to ask you to do this full time and to become our public spokesman. So use the public skills that you had developed over your career, and now we're going to formalize it into a real job. So there was no job description to it. It was simply a discussion over a cup of coffee that took about two minutes. And I now had a new job, which was the global spokesman. That job, I probably spent at least 100 speeches a year all over the world 
speaking on topics of finance, technology, the integration of the two, anything having to do with the emergence of our industry over the course of time. That was the most thrilling, exhilarating, privilege and honor of a job I have ever had. And little did I know that when I was doing that, how important that was going to be for my career several years later. It was awesome, but the cautionary tale, though, for the listeners is this was a job that didn't exist. There was no job description. It wasn't as if, hey, let's apply for this job. It was a job that was created out of the talent and skill set that I was able to demonstrate in one place that we found could be applicable in a much larger forum. So here I was spending my time developing business on one continent, but the skill set that was demonstrable, it was no big leap to think, how can we use this to sell our services in the rest of the world in these very public forums? So I think a lot of people, when they sit around thinking about what's my next job, my next career, sometimes they're waiting for a job description to appear or to emerge. My advice, if you think that there's something you can contribute, write your own job description and, and, and propose it to your boss. I, I think that is a formula for innovation, for something that takes advantage of one's individual skill set, and that also adds a lot of value. Look to see the things that you can add to your company that nobody else has noticed. Again, very good advice, Mr. Garcia. Wouldn't you love, Frank, to be able to write a job description or to be in a job where the job description doesn't exist? You make it up. How cool is that? One day when you and I have this discussion again, you're going to be able to tell me, hey, you know, and I'm going to say, Frank, what job are you in? It's the job that the description that I custom wrote and I proposed it to my boss and they bought it and now I do it. That is infinitely better than being subject to what somebody else's idea is of your skill set. That's probably going to be the next step in the business world, creating your own job descriptions. Oh, for sure. Oh, I, I think I, I wish I'd like to see more of it. I hope everybody begins to develop that practice. If you don't mind me asking, after 13 years at Bloomberg, you took a break from the finance world, correct? Not from the finance world, but I did reflect on my time at Bloomberg. At the time that Mike Bloomberg was running for mayor, he appointed a new CEO. And it wasn't my boss. My boss, I thought, was the heir apparent to the job. He appointed someone else. And it caused me reflection that after 14 years there, maybe it's time to go on and do something else. So I didn't take a break from finance. I've always been in that career. But I did move on to the asset manager, BlackRock, which was a small, not a small, medium-sized asset manager at the time that ultimately has evolved to become the largest asset manager in the world. If you don't mind me asking, what made you leave Bloomberg at this point? It was really my dissatisfaction in the individual that came in to be the new CEO. It was somebody I knew quite well out of our London office. Um, I was not enamored of him in the new role. And I'm not saying anything he doesn't already know if he's listening today. I was disappointed in that in that choice, but I recognized and respected that that's the choice that was made. And I saw that as, well, maybe it's my time to leave. I didn't want to work under that new regime. And it wasn't a bad thing. I think after many, many years in the same place, sometimes events occur that cause some self-reflection and change is good. And it was just an opportunity for me to rethink what my next chapter was going to be. And it was a good thing to have left because it changes your perspective, improves your skill set. A lot of good things happen in those kinds of changes. So I don't regret it at all. I'm glad I did. So you became an asset manager at BlackRock. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't an asset manager. I was actually responsible for the development of selling the asset management services that BlackRock provided. So in an asset management world, you have professional investment managers that actually manage the money, and then you have people like me that go out and sell and market the services for someone else in the company to do. And I think that's an important distinction that anyone in the finance world makes. In spite of the fact that there are people who manage the money, 
somebody has to sell the dream. And usually that skill set is not embedded in the analytical types that manage the money. That's what they do and they do it well. But they're not born or they're, they're not trained salespeople. I was a trained salesperson with a strong knowledge of finance. I wasn't necessarily at that point in my career wanting to manage the money, but I loved being the guy who could sell the services that other people could manage. How would you describe your experience at BlackRock? It was a very process-oriented and collaborative institution, very teamwork-focused, very smart, capable, professional place. People worked together very well. It had a strong sense of corporate culture. Very much in our minds was the need to serve the client, and the client was number one. We had a deep-seated responsibility that we were there to serve them, and every discussion and every action we ever had was for the purpose of how we could continue to improve the ability to service our clients. That's a very noble cause of them. Yeah, and that's an interesting way of looking at it because not every company has that culture, but in Bloomberg it's deeply embedded. And when we were hiring people, even when I was being hired, that cultural compatibility was a big deal and an important criteria in how they selected both talent and how they selected people for promotion. That's not something that... that I, I think in school, in college, they don't teach that enough, how critical that soft skill is of collaboration and culture. Because if you're brilliant and you're not good at collaborating or working on a team, you're, you're diminishing your value in the company. Would you say at the firms you had worked at that it ended up being more soft skills than hard skills that allowed someone to get ahead? Oh, absolutely. Because... I know when I got into Wall Street, I was surrounded by brilliance. And I, I was the dumbest guy in the room. The one thing that I can say, you will be surrounded by other brilliant people. So if everybody is equally technically competent and brilliant, what makes one individual be distinguished from the other? Well, it's not in your brilliance. You're all equally good. So where is where does the line that helps divide the difference between why one person gets promoted and somebody doesn't, that is rooted in your ability to communicate, to show conviction, to show collaboration, to have character and integrity. Those things are much more difficult to measure, but people know it when they see it. So that is a cautionary tale to anyone that is emerging in the finance world to recognize the importance of that skill set and never to take it for granted. Would you say that it's becoming less valued in modern culture or is possibly having a resurgence in modern culture? Oh, I, I think it's always been there. There's just some companies are louder voices as it relates to their culture more so than others. So when you look at somebody's core values, Many companies are careful to publish those values so that people can understand what that company stands for. And that value system to any CEO, that's usually the first thing that they'll tell you. It's the characteristics of how our people behave and your ability to engender trust. That is, it's never gone away. I don't believe it ever will. So that's a good thing to know, especially in a profession that's usually characterized as ruthless. It's that integrity and trust that can never be emphasized enough. It is, it is the foundation by which we work together. And if you breach that trust, it doesn't matter where you went to school, what your grades were, how smart you are, it's, you, you've diminished your capacity and potentially put your career at risk. Now, after four years at BlackRock, you changed firms again. I did. This time joining Citadel. How, how did that change occur? And what position did you end up taking on? Yeah, it, it was a very similar role. Um, from BlackRock is what's known as a traditional asset manager. And by that, I make the distinction there's two types of asset managers in this institutional world that we live in on Wall Street. 
There are the traditionals, which is BlackRock, and there are what's called the alternatives. And that's what Citadel is. They're otherwise known as a hedge fund. It's a different kind of institution in that it is a firm that is typically these hedge funds are much bigger risk takers. They're more trading oriented by that. They don't just invest for the long term to their clients. They employ a variety of strategies and tactics that help increase the profits, sometimes on a daily basis, weekly, hourly, it doesn't matter. They're much more trading oriented in how they go about investing. So after four years at BlackRock, Citadel was doing something very similar to what BlackRock was doing. And by then, after four years, I just felt I was in my mind, I was contemplating leaving all of this together because I wanted to form chapter two of my career. An opportunity came up that allowed me to change and I just felt I was restless and in need of change. And as it turns out, I was there less than a year because it was when I made that change that I was deep down inside considering something totally different. And that's teaching college, becoming an executive coach. So I think it was at a point in my career where I was anxious to find a transition point that would take me to the life that I lead now. And I just felt I couldn't do that at BlackRock, but at Citadel, it worked out particularly well. So, but it was a very different culture, different place, different people, different experience. You also ended up acting as a professor of organizational leadership and director of the undergraduate honors program at Mercy College. Correct. What made you decide to join the world of academia, aside from nearly a tired sense of the finance world? Yeah, well, part of it, I, I didn't know it at the time. In fact, if you had asked me in my years on Wall Street if I was ever going to teach college, I said, no, nah, there's no way. I was too enamored of the rat race that I was living. I loved what I was doing. I said, no, nah, I'm not going to teach. That's crazy. However, it's in the family business. It's in, it's in my DNA. My dad was a college professor. At, he's a professor of linguistics at the United States Military Academy of West Point. So I grew up with an academic dad. I have two brothers. They're both in academia. One of them is a full professor of musicology at Miami University of Ohio. And my other brother is like me. He has his own business, but he is on the faculty at NYU. And when I joined Columbia, I brought him with me. There was some space for him. So all of us, we all started our careers in something different. And I think it was my dad up there in heaven calling down to us that each of us brought this sense of service this sense of teaching, which is the culture that we grew up in, that everyone who has an expertise, at some point there may be a clear call to chosen. And I just felt, and I can't explain what it was. It was this feeling, now that I don't have to live this Wall Street life anymore, I was really in a place where I could design the kind of life that I wanted. So I asked myself, what do I want out of my life now? I wanted two things. I wanted more time and I wanted mobility to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do. So I said, oh, this is easy. I'm going to take the expertise that I was known on Wall Street, which is really about public speaking and communication, and I was going to form my own company so that I could monetize the talents at the same time in order to start that kind of leadership development and public communications training company. I thought it would be a good idea to get into the classroom where it could be a lab, so to speak, where I could learn to teach. If I could learn to teach college, then I could learn how to teach it at the executive level. And the reason I joined Mercy College is I had reached out to multiple colleges in the New York area to explain my pedigree and my desire to teach. Mercy College was not a college that I knew, but the dean of Mercy College was a former Merrill Lynch investment banker. And he and I got along really well. And he was adopting, which was a very different model for teaching undergraduate business. He wanted to populate it not with career academics, but with professionals who had a passion to teach. So even though I had communicated with many other colleges, I loved the program that he was building and the opportunity for me to start it from scratch. And I had a wonderful experience. And it was through that experience and the formation of my company 
which is called Klein Leadership International, where I spend a great deal of time coaching executives on the same skills that I teach in college that ultimately led me to Columbia University. So it, it, what a wonderful thing how one thing simply led to another and call it luck or call it smart. I'm not sure what it is, but it, it's just the, the notion that when you do good things and good work, people notice and it allows you to operate in many different places and many different mediums as long as you're bringing value you can bring it to a lot of places and how grateful I am for that. You had mentioned your company, Climb Leadership International. What was it like becoming an executive coach after all these years on Wall Street? You're now coming into the academia world. You've got some experience now teaching as a professor. And now you start your own company being an executive coach. Yeah, it was really cool. In, in a way, it seemed very natural. In fact, for all my years in, in my career ascent, what did I do? I spent a lot of time, whether I knew it or not, didn't know exactly what to call it, but I did spend a lot of time developing employees. And in a way, I was a coach. I just never labeled it that way. But I spent a lot of time because my responsibility was to help develop others. And when I think about how I did that, what I do in my company isn't a lot different than what I did when I was actually in those roles. So by teaching college, it helped me how to learn to be a teacher. And then in this executive world, I was able to combine the talents that I had developed over my executive life, integrated into my teaching skills. And now when I'm hired and I do coaching, it's a little bit like a private trainer in a gym. You know, it's one on one. And I got the skills that I had used over the years. I honed and learned teaching skills. And what you do is you put it all together and you help somebody do something better than what they did before. I have to say. I didn't know such a thing existed. For all the years, I didn't know there were guys like me floating around coaching CEOs and CFOs. Who knew? But it's a big industry because people need help. And they, are, they recognize the value of the individual instruction and inspiration that can come with someone who has that kind of experience and has honed the teaching skills along the way. So it's an intersection of subject matter expertise your ability to teach, and your passion and drive to wake up every day in the service of someone else's success. And if you can put all of those together, Frank, you're a coach. Do you feel it's something innate in someone, like some people just have it and some other don't, or is it something you can learn? Well, both. I, I think there is a certain DNA that you're good at it. I think a lot of it comes with the experiences that you've shaped over time and how you feel about working in the service of others' success. And then absolutely, can you learn it? Yes. There is an expression, once taught, twice learned. So every time you teach something, you see me in the classroom. Every time I teach, I'm learning something from the reactions of the students that come back to me. I'm learning something from the executives that I coach. How do they respond? I have to find a way in. Everybody has a different method that they respond to. So it causes me to have to be adaptable, to understand how people learn, what they respond to, the kind of coaching. It's a very cool thing because I coach so many different kinds of people, and then I teach so many kinds of people. So. Every time I do that, I think, I'd like to think it just makes me a little bit smarter and hopefully a better teacher. Just to jump back to your personal journey through life, while at Mercy College, is it correct to say that you received your master's degree there? I did. In fact, I had started graduate school mid-career and I never finished it. That was before there were online courses. And what I discovered when I was reaching out to the different colleges, they all said to me, do you have a master's degree? I said, no, I never finished it. I started it, I was 28 credits into it, and then I joined Bloomberg, and it was impossible. There was no way I could respond to the demands of that job and still go to school at night, so I bagged the whole thing. When I joined Mercy and every other college said, if you want to teach her, you have to get your master's. That is a requirement for accreditation. So I said, all right. So Mercy College had a master's program in organizational leadership, and they had an MBA. They said, take your pick. We don't care, but you got to get your master's. So in my first year of teaching, and I didn't know Mercy College. I was like, what the hell? All right, now I'm here. I'm teaching here. Sure. I just needed to get it. 
So my first year, I did not start client leadership. I needed to wait that year. Um, so when I was teaching, in parallel to that, I was taking courses for a year program in organizational leadership. So 12 months later, I had earned my master's degree now, and that was part of the deal. I had to have it. And then I spent the next six months writing my book. So it was really the first year and a half of my teaching that I had formed client leadership, but I hadn't done anything with it yet because I needed to get these things out of the way. So the master's was at mercy, but that was driven by my need to get it for purposes of, of ticking a box in the college requirement. Would you say that it's a barrier to entry for a lot of very qualified people who just don't have a college degree but may have years' worth of experience in a certain field? Absolutely. In fact, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, if we could bring him back to life, and Bill Gates are not qualified to teach in college. They, they, here's the sad part. They can't. Um, not, they not only not have masters, they never finish college. So there's, there's a bit of an irony here because the colleges respect something else and have a certain minimum requirement. So if we were to hire Bill Gates, we couldn't do it. We would tell Bill Gates, go back to college and then go back to get your masters. And this is a guy worth $70 billion. Far be it for us to say, but you know, that's okay. That's how the colleges operate. So anyone who contemplates in their life if they are contemplating ever teaching college, they're going to need a master's degree. So if you have an opportunity to get it sooner than later, I got mine a lot later than most people, but I didn't know I was going to make the transition to college teaching. But look at now, it led me to Columbia, of which I am honored and grateful and having a ball doing it, and I couldn't be on that faculty without it. So all's well that ends well. So while at Mercy, you also ended up doing a thesis, correct? I did. It was required as part of the master's program. So it was not only coursework, but you completed it with this monster thesis. And it was a 300-page thing that I wrote that I think two people in the world read because uh, that's what you needed to get your master's. And as much as I hated doing it, it did me a very big favor. I had no idea that I could write a book, and I didn't know whether I was going to write a great book or a piece of crap. But what I knew <laughs> is having written my thesis... I was like, wow, when I was reading it, I was like, hey, that's not all that bad. It's pretty academic, but what could I strip out of there and write that I think could be a useful and instructional tool both for my students and my clients? So while I didn't enjoy reading, writing the master's thesis, it was in the exercise of writing that that it helped me to discover that I think I can write a book that can actually be decent be a how-to and a call to action for my clients and my students to significantly improve their communication skills. Now, this book is called A Climb to the Top, correct? That is correct. That is the title. The subtitle is Leadership and Communication Tactics to Take Your Career to New Heights. Now, everybody, just as a quick note, you can find this down in the description along with Mr. Garcia's company. Now, I also have a question of how you ended up tying the thesis. What was the summary of the book? If you could give it clip notes really quick. Well, let, let me first just state that the narrative of the book was based on my personal passion for mountaineering. I became a mountaineer at the age of 42. I have climbed seven expeditions around the world, and I used mountaineering as a metaphor for career climbing. So to summarize the book very quickly, it is a book on how to accelerate your career growth by climbing the career mountain with the soft skills that I describe in the book. It is a strong focus on communication skills as an avenue to ascend to the top of career mountains on the notion that the most compelling communicators are the ones that rise to the top. So I created a framework called the Ten Commandments and help people to understand that if you want to become a better communicator, I have a framework that can help you to do that. There are other frameworks, but this is the one that worked for me, and I'm confident it can work for you. Now, just to shift your focus, how did this tie into you working at Columbia? It was, it was happenstance, again, a little bit of luck. The Columbia thing happened out of the blue. Part of the engineering program at Columbia, there are 11 different majors. One of those majors is financial engineering. So they put it in the same program as biomedical, chemical, mechanical, etc. A guy I used to work with at BlackRock 
who was a graduate of the master's program in financial engineering. He called me out of the blue, and I hadn't seen him in a few years, and explained to me we would like to start a lecture series of Wall Street veterans. And you're the first person I thought of. Could you come into the financial engineering class and speak to us about your book? I was like, sure, I'd be happy to. And he said, emphasize the communication skills for a bunch of math-centric in individuals who need to understand the importance of communication. So I went in there with no expectations. There were 350 financial engineers that were waiting for me. I delivered a, a topic on what was the Ten Commandments out of my book. And somebody at Columbia noticed and said, wow, that was cool. Can you come back for the other engineers? Yeah, no problem. So I came back for the other engineers. And they said, oh, that was really cool. What else do you teach? And I said, what else do you need? Whatever you teach, we need. I said, all right, I think we can do that. So that was the impetus for Columbia in the graduate engineering program to say, I think we're on to something. We have this guy, Chuck Garcia, who came in here and talked about all of these soft skills and the importance of it in career growth, even for highly specialized fields like engineering. So they started a program called PDL, Professional Development and Leadership, that is a complement to all of the hard skills that they learned. And they hired me and a couple other professionals like me, including my brother, who's the crisis communications manager, to come into the program and to continually teach these soft skills to the hard skilled engineers. And I got to say, it's been an honor and an absolute pleasure. Now, how would you say the power of someone's network, who they know, really plays into their success as well? Yeah, well, who you know is not a formula necessary for success just on its own, but who you know is an incredibly important component of, of how you will accelerate your career. But let me, let me put a twist to that. Not just who you know, who you trust, who you like to work with, because we all have to look out for each other. We have an obligation to the people in our lives who we're friends with, that we trust. And, and the metaphor that I use in my book was set a goal one step at a time, can't do it alone. That's the third component of career climbing, that you build a coalition of people around you. And in the case of networking, the good guys want to hang out with the other good guys. And the guys that bring a high performance expectation and are good guys, those are the guys you gravitate to. Those are the ones that you want to work with, the ones that you want to recommend to future employers, the ones that you want to take under your wing, the people that you grow up with, that this is my team, my tribe. That is a really important thing, not just for career development, but for, for personal development. You got to know who your friends are and you got to protect them. That, that is such a key thing because you want them to protect you. And what I write about in the book is something called the law of reciprocity. That if you want to succeed, help others to succeed and they will help you. I live and breathe by that mantra that we, we are here to help each other. I don't help everybody. I help the good guys because I know that they're going to help me. And that is my recommendation to be careful and choosy about who you put into your world because they are a reflection of you. And that's where the network power comes in. It leads you to wonderful places. Great words of wisdom there, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Now, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask you about more maybe topics about our world. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the effect of the growth and integration of technology on Wall Street over the years, as you've had such a pivotal role in it and its yeah. development? Right. Well, it's always been there. And I, I came of age in the 80s, just when technology was really starting to emerge. It was the birth of the PC, the birth of Apple, the birth of the World Wide Web. So if you look at the confluence of the things that occurred in the late 80s, early 90s, that's really where I was at the forefront of my own career development. It's always and always will be an integral part of automating, mechanizing, allowing machines to do the things that we as humans cannot do as quickly. It will continue to be a driving force in changing how we go about business. But I'd like to think that no matter how important and how fast all of this technology continues to emerge, I'm pretty old school in knowing that it's still people that got to make the decisions. It's still people that got to work together. It's great to have the technology, but 
I want to be one of those evangelists, not that I am anti-technology, I'm not, but I am pro-people, and that technology is a means to an end. It should not overtake what we do, although I suspect one day it's going to automate just about everything. It's going to be a touch of a button. However, the ability to be a concise, compelling, and powerful communicator, God knows, I hope the machines never do that better than us. So I'm holding out a little bit of faith that we're still going to be the experts on these soft skills. But I recognize how critical the development of technology is to continue to make the world a better place. Now, how would you compare the world of Wall Street to the world of executive coaching and to the world of academia? Because each seems like they'd be very different, but maybe <laughs> they not. They are, Frank. They are different. Uh, the world of Wall Street is a world driven by money, fear, greed. It's very dynamic. People are in it to make money, to succeed. It's so career-oriented. You come in here at the speed of light, and it's really fast, and it is, it's really fun and exhilarating, but it is also incredibly demanding, and it's not for everybody. It was for me, but it, it is... It is something that if you're going to join a career in finance, be very careful about what you're going into and understand is it culture compatible with your own values. The world of coaching is a wonderful thing. It is, a, it is rewarding. I mean that not just financially but personally because you are able to touch the lives of people individually, one at a time in a really custom way. And the world of academia is a very different thing. College is a critical component, not just for your career, but for your life. And I'm grateful to be a part of it, that I can help with the, particularly in the undergraduates. I think the most important part of what I bring to academia is not so much my ability to teach business. I think a lot of people can do that. I think it's my ability to help you how to be a business person, how to behave, how to bring all of those things that you don't necessarily learn in a book, but what are you going to do when you get to your job on the first day? How are you going to be? How are you going to act? That is, I think, what I bring. At least I'd like to think if I've got any kind of secret sauce. I think everybody has it, but college to me, is too focused on, on the dogma of the academia and the discipline of rote learning for things that are not practical. My responsibility is to bring an utterly pragmatic way of what you can expect to get off your parents' payroll when you start your job, because it's about job outcomes now. It's not about building minds or creating open minds. Yeah, it's all well and good, but you got to pay back these loans. It's really expensive, and you need a job that's going to allow you to do that. So to me, college is about building your future, about understanding and discovering who you are, and about hopefully going out to get the best job that is right for you. It's the pragmatism. It's the skills you need to build your life. I cannot emphasize that enough. Academic rigor has its place, but I think it's only a small component of a much bigger picture. One final question before we go. Yeah. Is there any advice you recommend a student or aspiring business person interested in finance or another business field? Maybe something you haven't touched on. My advice is don't just be obsessed with learning the rigor of academia so that you have a good report card. I appreciate the importance of grades, but that's not what this is about. Your experience and you and your friends who are picking the colleges is about character development, about personal development, about using the human interaction skills, communication, ethics, all of those things that may not appear on a scorecard, but will be utterly visible to the people whose lives you are going to come into. So leave room and leave plenty of space for personal development as it relates to your ability to communicate and connect with others. That, to me, Frank, is a number one advice. Very good advice to give.
Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Garcia. You are quite welcome, Frank. It is my pleasure. Be sure to check out Chuck Garcia's book, A Climb to the Top, and his company, Climb Leadership International, in the description below. They are outstanding resources for your career development. Thank you for listening, and remember to check back with the primary source next month, where we always get to the core of matters. Good night.